trucking through that as well. Um, and honestly, we actually have grown every single year since 2005 and opening. Uh, we've continued to grow each year. So that led us to 2018 or well, fall 2017, Funding National Park put out a uh, request for proposals for an adventure outfitter for a 10 year license of occupation in the park. Um, when that came out, we were quite excited, um, a little bit scared, but quite excited to put in our proposal and make it happen. Uh, I believe there's eight other proponents that also put in proposals. We luckily, part of our business plan from day one was to get into more of the adventure tourism side of things and kind of get outside, not just in a retail atmosphere. So we put in a proposal in December 2017. We found out that we had won that bid and uh, then we had to realize that we had pretty much bluffed our proposal. Now the real work began. So it was time to kind of make it all happen. That that operation was they're looking for someone for boat rentals, kayaks, canoes, and paddle boards at Bennett Lake, which is a small lake in Fundy. And they wanted someone to operate mountain bike rentals and outdoor adventure gear, backpacking equipment to be rented as well as a shuttle bus to shuttle people to various uh, trailheads around the park. So we scrambled that winter, uh, or yeah, that winter, I basically stepped into the retail realm and said to my staff, I'm gone for the next three months, um, stuck behind a computer and running back and forth to Fundy. And we opened May long weekend in 2018. So we've got three seasons. Uh, 2018 was, was actually an awesome first summer because it was really hot so everyone was going to the coast uh, to get away from the heat inland in New Brunswick and beyond and obviously back then we had people coming from all over the world um, so Fundy is a world-renowned I'll say destination for travelers um, so we had a great first summer the next winter Fundy asked us if we would get into the winter operation uh, with fat bike rentals uh, so they actually bought a fleet of fat bikes from me and then got us to rent them with a maintenance contract in place that worked out really well for a starting point. We started with six fat bikes and we basically took reservations and I drove from Sussex to Fundy every time we had a reservation for two bikes and it obviously wasn't profitable, but we, uh, we got through it. And uh, that was our first winter of winter operation. Um, so I'll move sort of a little more current and then on to some other slides. Um, 2020, so 2019 was sort of a normal-ish year for us. 2020, as far as the adventure tourism side of things, was obviously uh, had its challenges for all of us. Um, we got through that as well. We were, the park didn't open until July. So we had to kind of figure out what the real operating season was, but we made that happen. Luckily for us, the retail background is kind of our, our mainstay. Um, everybody wanted to buy outdoor gear and bikes. The bike industry saw the biggest boom they've seen in probably 50 years. So retail was crazy, um, busy, and we grew through the pandemic. Actually, we were one of the fortunate ones, I'll say. Um, on the outfitter side, not so much, obviously, but the the retail side was has been really good this year. So I'm thankful for that. And in 2021, now what? So we have lots of ideas um, on paper and things we're looking to develop. I'll jump into kind of my next slides though, um, building a bit on the foundation of where we started and kind of what our vision is looking into the future as well. So community and collaboration have been two things that I've been very, I always keep in mind in anything I do. Um, before I keep going, Jonathan, anybody have any questions, comments, anything you want to jump in with yet? I know I'm starting to ramble a little bit. No, I think uh, it's good that you've got a bit of that core story that people can uh, reference. Uh, okay. From and keep on going. Okay. So I believe where it all started and building that foundation of loyal supporters and ambassadors was truly back to that $50 a month uh, behind a convenience store. I can remember literally opening up the doors and there was a farmer's market around the corner. I'd just leave the garage open and walk over to the farmer's market and grab a sausage and a drink and walk back to the garage and there'd be a customer waiting there for me and be like, oh, where were you? And it's like, I just went for lunch. And but they're just hanging out, waiting for me to come back. The door was wide open. So it's kind of building those loyal followers um, all along the way um, and ambassadors and people that believed in what we were doing. And it was always more than just selling stuff to people. It was kind of that core, you know, building the community around us and making sure we we're always working with our local other businesses, other uh, operators as well. So we always, part of my main marketing focus has always been just organizing events, volunteering at things, uh, group activities, um, 
whether it's mountain bike rides or skiing or snowshoeing events, being involved in the community, offering our Sprockets youth cycling program. That's really been our, our marketing plan. Um, probably five, five years ago, I stopped paying a single dollar for any radio or print advertising. And I decided we were putting it all into community activities, uh, not just the money, but just our time as money basically. So that was kind of a turning point for me is when, when radio and print advertisers called or emailed or whatever stopped and I was like, just straight up, no, sorry, it's not where we're, not what we're doing. And it's, you know, we were probably spending 30 or 40,000 bucks a year on that kind of advertising. So we just went from that to zero um, and it's worked out great so far. So I'm just gonna go through a bunch of slides of photos of some of the events and activities we do in our community. So Ellen's Tour to Sussex is one of them. This is the, a, an event we started four years ago, maybe five now, uh, when our good friend Ellen Waters um, suddenly passed away from a, a car accident riding her bike. And I can pause for emotion, I'm sorry. <laughs> so. No worries, buddy. I didn't expect that. So this event, um, I think went from the first year having 50 people up to third year having 250. So we, we literally rent the event space across from the store, directly across from the store. Uh, we had three routes for various levels of riders. It's in memory of Ellen. Um, we let me hire the local German restaurant to cater it. We have a beer garden. We hired a, every year we hire a local band to play. So it's more about the celebration than the ride really. So we, I think we had the longest was 110 K ride, but everybody starts and finishes at the same place. And then it's the big celebration after with an awesome feast of German food and great beer and awesome music. Um, and showcasing the downtown has always been a big part of it. So we have registration for the event at the store, but it cycles through to the craft brewery and we make sure we're telling people all about the local like the main street restaurants and cafes and that kind of stuff and when they're touring the route specifically take in you know the local scenery they go by the local landmarks uh they cross a ferry across the Belle Isle bay um so it's all kinds of cool little spots like that that make it a real true uh community event so we're quite proud of that one this is ellen's mother in the yellow shirt there and that is the leonard's gate uh, festival area so you're looking from the back of it straight toward the store on Main Street in Sussex. Uh, there's again just another quick shot of the, the group when we could actually get together not wearing masks and you know be close and sweaty and gross and, and have a good time. <laughs> so we're hoping this year we'll try to get this event going again in some capacity. It may not look like this obviously but we'll probably break it into some smaller rides and smaller groups or self-guided trips and things like that. We're meeting next week to chat on that one. Um, here's another collaboration with our local brewery, so Sussex Ale Works. Uh, they're literally connected to the store, as you saw in a previous photo. The LBS Kolsch is their first edition of a uh, so LBS local bike shop. This is also, I believe, in collaboration with Mountain Bike Atlantic. Sam might be able to help me on that one a little bit. Sam Bosens is on the call. Um, but they're working on, I believe, a, a series of collaborative beers monk shops and brewers and mountain bike inspired which is one of those really cool things so the the brewery itself is actually as you'll see in the next photo so here's the inside of the brewery it's very adventure themed so when the local brewery rick and elena opened we chatted a lot on sort of themes and i'm not part of the brewery but it's connected so they're my tenant and they really wanted to kind of make it that upright adventure scene upright upright ski upright bike upright adventure so on the wall, there's actually a map of the area with all the trails and my logo and Poly Mountain, the local ski hills logo with lines drawn to where they are, the Fundy coastlines. It's a really cool little tap room. Um, it's been an awesome synergy for the store and the app racing. So as you'll see the Mountain Bike Atlantic jerseys there, this was a ride that we called our uh, Bluff and Beyond. So the Bluff is one of our local uh, trails. And every year, um, spring and or fall, some years we'll do the Bluff and Beyond. It went from kind of 10 or 12 people going for a ride to I think 95 the last time we did it. And we had like 60 people jammed into this little tap room. And it was, I think the, the bar turned at the end of the day was like, can you do this every Sunday afternoon? This is amazing. So it was one of those really uh, pretty amazing feeling events just to be able to share it in another local business. 
where are we at for time here? Um, another kind of cool collab we do with the, the local brewery right here is you'll see their their flights for their sample beer are cut off tips of skis. So all of our warranty skis, um, if skis come in damaged or need to be sent back or something, uh, we send them over to them and Rick chops them off, drills holes in them, and that's how they serve their flights. So it's really that après, après ski scene uh, built into it. Uh, down in Fundy in Alma, we have another local brewer, another theme here, obviously the, the craft brewery works well with Adventure. So the Holy Whale opened uh, a couple of years, before, I think a year before we moved down there. And we also have a retail store in Alma that we opened the same year that we started offering, uh, started operating as the Adventure Outfitter in Fundy. So the Holy Whale is two doors up from us from our retail store in Alma. So often any events we're doing in Alma, we're promoting going to the Holy Whale or the Tipsy Tail restaurant or pizza place or the Octopus Garden Cafe and restaurant. Um, so again, just making sure we're collaborating with locals, pushing people to go there for that apres scene or get the cans to go, um, go down to the beach and enjoy. Here's another just local, again, building on that community side. So one of our events we did, I think it was last February, just before shutdown, was a snowshoe track taste and tour with our local uh, craft distillery. So they distill rum um, and other spirits. So it was literally just a, a casual, this is a free event for us actually, we just, community event that we put out because we want to go out with people. I think we had 20 or 30 people for this little event, but we went for a snowshoe track tasting and tour of the distillery. And then a lot of the people that were on that spent a couple hundred dollars on bottles of rum for uh, for gifts for people and for their local <laughs> for their own cabinet obviously so that was a really fun event we look forward to getting back to doing more of that again john can i ask a yep. quick, quick question so yeah. I, I love um and i hope uh, others are seeing this you know this this role of using events sort of as that main communication connection to your community yeah. how did you uh how did you communicate this out to people so these much? events yeah, so was it social media, was it? Yeah, 100% uh, social media. And then any recurring weekly or monthly events or annual events we do would be just listed on our website under events and community. Okay. Thanks. But yeah, almost 100% almost social media and word of mouth in the store. Um, the odd poster on the bulletin board for the people that aren't on social media but are coming into the store regularly or just know that we are always doing events. They'll call us and say, what's you know anything going on this month or this winter? We're looking forward to it kind of thing. Great, thanks. Yep. That's just a simple photo of uh, snowshoeing, obviously. Simple things like taking the fat bikes, dressing up in funny costumes uh, in the Santa Claus Christmas parade. Um, you know, we just put lights around the rims and just kind of have fun biking in the parade. So just little things like that. This is our Sprock Kids Youth Cycling Program that we started in 2016. Um, like we had 28 kids that first year, aged like seven to 12, uh, an eight week program that we, partner technically with our uh, local cycling club. So this does cost money, it's $75 for the kids to enter. They get a pair of sunglasses and a little bottle of lube and a uh, t-shirt and then eight week program. And that money goes into our club for buying trail tools and uh, just trail maintenance primarily. And then to also buy supplies to run the program. And it, it obviously by by us volunteering our time to run these programs spurs on many of the kids bringing in their bikes to get tuned up or needing parts or helmets or gloves. But the coolest thing with this event was to see after the fact how much the kids progressed and then how many times we saw them out with their brothers and sisters and parents on the trails that would never have been riding the nature trail or other trails if they hadn't get involved. And so here we are five years later and our local ski hill, Pulley Mountain, opened this winter um or sorry this summer at the bike park and i know there's at least three kids in that group that are now riding the bike park on mountain bikes um and it's so cool to see that progression of the kids coming up through the community and being a part of the community store the local bike shop just another shot of our bluff and beyond ride so we took our vehicle out midway and had a cooler full of our local craft beer and had some refreshments along the ride and then again, going to a local restaurant afterwards. Um, I think we set a record that day for, I think we had, I think there's like 50 people roughly in the restaurant. That's not the record. The record is the number of flying pig burgers that we pre-ordered. I think we sold 28 flying pig burgers that day. So the, uh, the operator was pretty pumped to see us. And that was sort of became the signature 
burger of <laughs> recarb refueling after the ride. So it's uh, it's kind of been the running joke, the flying pig burger. I'll probably end up naming a trail someday, the flying pig, I'm sure. But they are always happy to see us come back every year and make sure we pre-booked the whole area and even place as many flying pig pre-orders as we can for them as they stock out. Um, so I'll pause here for a moment. Are there any questions, comments? Anyone want to jump in with anything? Or are we I want to keep on rambling? Anybody else have a question? Unmute. John, I'm just curious if with the amount of community partnerships and community building that's happening yep. uh, or that you've done, um, do you in return see growth in the bike or ski community? Like, I, you, know, I, you know, I understand how on one side uh, doing events like this will get more bikers out to the brewery or supporting, you know, other restaurants or whatnot. Uh, but is it ever the case where you're working in the shop and some guy comes in and says he wants to buy a mountain bike because he saw all you guys, you know, chowing down on these burgers some evening? Uh, I 100% believe that that is one of the reasons for our success right now. I would say that there have been, even I'll say, I'll give kind of a, lots of examples, but I was on a CBC interview a couple weeks ago and it was a call-in show and a lady called in who had been on that snowshoe trek as an example. And she, I think she had rented snowshoes from us that time. And on the CBC call-in, she's like, yeah, I love John's events and they outdoor albums. They do all these cool community events. And we went out on a snowshoe and went to the distillery and I went and bought a pair of snowshoes the next day because it was so much fun. I wanted to get out more. So there's definitely direct correlation to our community involvement. And I, I don't like to say, I, I actually take offense to people saying, oh, I know why you're doing that. Because it's definitely not why we do it but the return on it is obviously positive for the business but i think it's also positive for the community and, and everything that's happening um so yes i would say 100 percent. and we'll often whether we're loaning things out for free most of our events are free we're not charging money for them we'll give people snowshoes to try we'll give them out bikes to try um they want to try a fat bike you know we'll say go take it go spin on the, the nature trail and if that's something that's leading to a potential sale, that's awesome. If they're just out having a good time, that's great too. Does that answer your question, kind of? No, 100%. Thank you. Okay. Anything else or I keep moving here? Keep on going, John. Yeah. So I will get to, I know this is a little more about sort of the value of trails, mountain biking and fat biking. I guess I mentioned to Jonathan before we started to trying to sort of lay that foundation of kind of, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes building it from the ground up. And I feel like we're just getting, you know, we're 15 years in, I'll say we're three, four years into really the, the adventure tourism side of it. And I feel like we're just starting to build up our platform for where we're really looking to, what we're looking to do. Um, so people, places, and partnerships, I've mentioned a little bit about that already, but there's a bit more to it, obviously. So surrounding yourself with good people. I know all of you know this and you're part of those people a lot of the times um, at various things we go to. Um, but whether it's your team or your tribe and by your tribe, I mean, and some of you know this, but the people you're hanging out with, the activities, the business owners, the, the downtown business associations, the chamber of commerce is the business development teams, all of those types of people that we're surrounding ourselves with that help us, you know, that are cheerleaders and our ambassadors. Um, I think are so critical to, to success and making sure we're aligning with them um, and connecting with them as often as possible, especially even during the pandemic times, it's even more important. So I, I love these occasions to be able to, uh, to see people that are in the same industry, especially. Um, so that's kind of the people part, you know, the places is both where do I play and where do I want to do business? For me, luckily the two are the same basically. Um, Funding National Park was where I grew up hanging out with my family. It's like I said, 40 minutes from my hometown where I grew up. Um, I didn't really expect as a kid that I would be exploring those trails and then running a business there in my later life. Um, we strive, we really want to start connecting more on a lot of other venues and build up our rental fleets to be able to make them mobile and take them different places to offer different experiences like Hopewell Rocks, which is, you know, if you haven't been there, it's a pretty phenomenal place. Uh, you'll see in a second uh, a little video of uh, sort of explore the ocean floor fat bike tour experience that we're looking to develop and start offering. We'd hoped to last summer, but we put it on hold. 
uh, the Fundy Trail Parkway is another place that's just, it's going to be an amazing park. It already is, but it's just on the cusp of really blowing up and it's going to be the next 10 years are going to be really cool to see it unfold. Uh, and then beyond, you know, I, I, I dream of days of organizing trips to Peru, to the to Machu Picchu or to Spain for cycling tours and things like that. Um, not, uh, you know, not anytime soon, but down the road, that's kind of the dream, I would say, and always has been. And then who do you want to work with? So partners you want to align with, we've shown a few of those local collaborations, but even on a bigger scale for us, you know, Funding National Park, other national parks, provincial tourism associations, all those types of things. Um, people that are equally invested as you are in what you're trying to achieve. So to me, I'll get into this in a second, but places like Fundy, <clears throat> having known before we put the proposal in that they were really investing heavily into trail infrastructure and cleaning up the park and trails and that development same as uh, fundy trail parkway knowing that the development's happening there those are people i want to align with so that i can we can go in the same we're going the same direction for the same reasons and then the infrastructure piece just to sort of build on that is uh that they see the value of putting the infrastructure in place and getting input from other operators like all of us to build it for the visitor especially and make sure that that visitor experience is in mind with everything they do and I think Fundy National Park as an example my prime example has they've done an amazing job at really laying out that infrastructure in a way that helps build especially from the bottom up so that beginner experience and that family experience. So here's just a quick video of one of our uh, local beaches it's Waterside Beach We've done a few sort of mini pilots, I'll say here, mostly sort of family and friends. Uh, I'll start the video, but it's a uh, it's UNESCO bios, UNESCO designated biosphere, UNESCO biosphere reserve. <laughs> I think I got that right. Um, it's about 10 kilometers outside of Alma, outside of Fundy National Park. Uh, there's four kilometers of pristine beach along these red cliffs. And uh, I thought it hit play, sorry. So it's not the greatest quality, but you kind of get the idea of the experience you could have riding a fat bike, uh, summer or winter. I think this is a fall uh, day, like October, November, but summer or winter fat bikes along this beach, you can ride for four kilometers from Waterside Beach all the way to Dennis Beach, which is a little bit, you know, uh, another sort of secluded beach around a point. And it, it's like riding on a different planet. It's one of the most incredible places. If I need a if I need a place to go chill and clear my head, I'll just go walk on this beach or fat back on this beach or go have a beer on the beach. It's, it really is a special place. And we look forward to not exploiting it, but taking small groups here to really experience that amazing coastline. Um, what we kind of foresee there is a few different options, hopefully partnering with the Fundy Biosphere and their interpreters that have the knowledge to do the talk or they would help train us and my staff on providing that experience there um, to talk about the geology and the history and the tides. Um, that would kind of be the idea of it and a little bit of that explore the ocean floor, um, you know, getting down with the kids and seeing what's under, under the sand and under the rocks and those types of things. Same as in Fundy National Park, one of the goals will be partnering with their uh, interp team um, so that we can start developing that you know, a fat bike tour, mountain bike ride, or a hike through the park, but adding the interpretation piece, it's uh, really critical to their mandate. And then connecting the local community as well would be, uh, you know, going to the Holy Whale after some of those experiences or one of the lobster shops for a lobster roll or the restaurants or the coffee, um, sticky buns that like we, we were offering, uh, we had been offering a sticky bun trail run. So we'd go for a trail run and then coffee and sticky buns. If you're not familiar with the famous sticky buns in Alma, Make sure if you're in Alma, you stop at Kelly's Big Shop for a sticky bun. So that was kind of some of the places we really want to be operating and partnering with. Um, moving on to sort of the people part of it. And that team, um, I've been fortunate over the years to have honestly incredible people working with me. Um, I really truly try never to say people working for me, it's always with me. I, none of us can do what we do without an awesome team. This is just a quick snapshot of uh, my team this winter. I know we called it a Monday staff meeting. We're closed on Mondays. We always have been. Hopefully, we always will be. It's, we call it kind of Mental Health Monday. Uh, we don't always get together, but we'll often see each other here at the ski hill or on the trails, mountain biking, going to Fundy for a hike, whatever it happens to be. But 
you know, growing your team um, is so critical to success and making sure you have the right people and the right attitudes. Um, and so that's, that's been just absolutely critical to me. So we go from right now, we have a team of uh, six full-time uh, in the store and working in Fundy for the winter operation. Um, we'll and we start hiring probably another 10 or 12 right now for the boat rentals, bike rentals, and the Alma stores. So we kind of grow from sort of core five or six to 15, 16 through the summer typically. And that'll likely grow more over the next couple of years as we get more into various experiences that we're exploring right now. Again, just you know, having the right people on board that are making that experience for the customers awesome and just friendly, fun people. We decided to throw the, we put the fun and fundy on the back of our shirts. Uh, that's kind of one of our ideas that we really want to make sure that's what we're doing. People are coming to fund it. They want things to do. We want them to do it with us and provide the gear they need and, you know, the, the knowledge they want to explore the park um, and find things they may not have known were there. So uh, just one of our other staff down at uh, our retail store in Elma, just displaying a slack line. Uh, Kay was awesome. She was our summer student last year at our Elma retail store. Hoping she comes back this year. And again, that retention piece, trying to keep people year to year is so critical as well. It's not always easy, but uh, we try to do our best to make sure we're providing a fun, enjoyable work experience and environment. And uh, I, luckily we've had a lot of returning staff. So it's been, uh, I've been fortunate that way. Uh, the infrastructure piece and partnering with people. So back to that Fundy National Park piece. And um, this isn't the greatest photo of what's there, but uh, right now, as so we started kind of our original agreement didn't include an actual bike rental space. It was all under the uh, one location where the boats are to the lake, which was not where the mountain bike trails were. So it didn't make sense. So we, we proposed to the park to use one of their old buildings. It was a campground kiosk to make it into our bike hut for now. It was temporary. We've had it for two, three years now, but we'll be moving into a newer, big, bigger building, hopefully this spring, that'll be much more suitable for what we're growing into. So we went from six bikes to I think 18 mountain bikes and now we have 24 fat bikes on top of that with another 20 uh, another 24 mountain bikes coming this spring so our fleet's growing obviously beyond the capacity of what we have in that little building so again that partnership with the park excuse me has been paramount in assisting us to grow and succeed at what we're doing so when i say look we need a bigger building they say well what can we find they luckily just built a new maintenance garage. So they had this old building that they can move. So they're going to fix it up, put it on a flatbed and drive it up the hill and park it here. Um, so it's, you know, rather than a building being destroyed and kind of going to waste, we're going to refurb it and, and make it into an awesome bike rental shack. And John, I have a, yeah. Sorry, I have a question, John. Please. Um, so just, it, uh, I know you already mentioned this about your partnership with Fundy. Um, uh, can you walk us through, just because I'm sure there are people on this call that could benefit from the arrangement you have with Fundy, in terms of what you said, that they actually purchased the fat bikes, and then um, like the ste steps, like that the, the park made the investment up front, and then you are the rental fleet provider, is that correct? And, and um, you oversee those operations? Like, is that repeatable, do you think, for any of these other operators on the call? Um, I laugh because I think that was a one-off. Uh, lucky for me, they had money in a budget, and they didn't, at, the current, at that time, they didn't have an operator. So they had a budget to buy equipment to, for a service to their visitors. So they said, we have this much money, how many fat bikes can we get? And I gave them a good deal to get as many as we could. They bought them from my store. It wasn't at that time their operator actually, but they are not in the business of renting and collecting money basically other than their campgrounds traditionally. So they purchased the fat bikes and then we had an agreement, <clears throat> a maintenance agreement and a percentage of revenue agreement for that, uh, for just those six fat bikes. Um, was all everything else has been on me so that was sort of a one-off they had money in a budget to help it was kind of in a part of their uh, infrastructure plan at the time so that was three four years ago um, those spikes are almost at the end of their life now so that's pretty much ready to expire so everything since then has been on me as an operator to purchase but the bigger piece of that is my license of occupation is a 10-year agreement as the adventure, official adventure outfitter for Funding National Park, providing, and I have very strict um, 
parameters of what I have to provide and what we have to abide by hours of operation, days of the week, um, being bilingual, obviously, the number of bikes, number of boats, safety protocols, all of those things are built into that 10-year agreement and a percentage. So basically, I'm renting my spaces from the park. So they take a percentage of revenue and I have to report to them annually with all our visitor information and revenue and all that. Does that answer Thank your you. question? Okay. Yeah, that, that, totally. I just thought it was interesting that it might uh, serve uh, some of the others on the call. It's awesome. Thank you. I think there are ways. Um, so that, as much as I say that's a one-off, I sort of jokingly every year be like, oh, if you have any more money in the budget, you want to buy bikes, let me know. <laughs> it is a win-win, but uh, they don't seem too uh, keen on buying any more equipment. Now they have an operator that's uh, buying their own. But I think there are opportunities to explore with various not-for-profits and provincial organizations and national parks that, you know, maybe they do have areas in their budgets to buy equipment, but they aren't in the game of renting or maintaining them. So I think it's always worth exploring that avenue with anyone that's a partner that may have a budget bigger than your own, right? <clears throat> Whether their budget's bigger than your own or not may be irrelevant, but it certainly helps uh, as kind of a to spur on that activity. Um, so yeah, from the bike rentals to the infrastructure and Fundy, um, that what I was mentioned before about Fundy investing in the infrastructure that they complete trail redesign for mountain bike specific trails. So that one of those trails I talked about poaching um, years and years ago was Whitetail, which is a hiking specific trail, but was also an amazing downhill mountain bike trail. So five kilometers of consistent fun downhill. Um, old school single track is now a IMBA certified signature trail, I believe is the right designation. And so now that's one of their signature trails in the park is a mountain bike trail it is hiking, it's shared with hikers, which I think is a mistake, but they'll probably change that eventually because it's people are shuttling that one trail as an example, and it's going to be, it's, there's gonna be conflict on it. But needless to say, we went from poaching it to it being a pretty amazing signature mountain bike trail in the park that they spent a lot of money to build. And along with other trails, you'll see here in a second. Um, so as an example, they invested in an, an amazing pump track, I'll say a world-class pump track, but it's, uh, if you're not familiar with what a pump track is, uh, it's just a series of rollers and berms and jumps. Um, and this one is really cool because it's a gravel surface, so it's nice and firm. It's fairly easy maintainable. Uh, it's in the forest, which is really cool, where most pump tracks tend to be in the open. Um, and it's very family friendly. We actually rent uh, push bikes, balance bikes for little kids. And they can go like two and three year old. I should have posted that video of two and three year old kids going around this pump track on balance bikes. And it's just awesome. And this will be one of the most popular venues in the park for families coming from the campground uh, right across the road from where a bike rental hut is. So you can see, you know, 20, 30, 40 kids rip around this pump track on a normal summer day. And it's, it's just awesome. And it's that kind of beginner friendly learn to ride uh, environment. So this is a not the greatest picture of the building, but this is a fleet of our our fat bikes that we uh, purchased last year, or six of them anyway, in front of the Chignecto Recreation Area. So part of that infrastructure piece um, was this, I call it the million dollar bathroom. Um, it's an amazing big building at the trailhead that has wood stoves in it and propane heat. Uh, it's a huge picnic area and communal area that's open 24 seven uh, all year round. and I call it the million dollar bathroom because the washrooms are the nicest ones in the park. There's, uh, I think there's even heated floors in the showers and like it's just this awesome space that if I'm camping in fun, I usually go there instead of the campground washrooms if I need, <laughs> need a shower. But the, that Apre ride scene they've developed, there's a bike wash station and the picnic area and the washrooms and showers um, right at the trailhead. So you can park your car, have a picnic, go for a ride or mountain bike rentals are right there so the whole it's all kind of come together as a package and it's it's so cool to see that come to life all year round now so last weekend and the weekend before just quick point of interest we've had uh our two busiest bike rental days period summer or winter the last two or three saturdays so we're finally starting to see that success of building it up um, and actually seeing some return on the investment into, you know, the bikes. I mean, each one of those bikes is you know, not just number dropping, but, you know, each one of those bikes is 1200 bucks and we've got 24 fat bikes now and 18 or whatever, 18 or 24 more coming. So we've invested large in it. So it's, it's nice to see it coming together. It's been a lot of hard work. And it's taken a lot of focus from me taking from the retail side 
to uh, really putting my effort into the adventure uh, tourism side of it. And then obviously, uh, this is just a picture of my son on a fat bike, but we do have the kids' fat bikes as well. But the other uh, awesome piece in the winter is that the park is investing time and energy into both equipment and trail grooming and the crew is grooming the trails that we're starting to get more consistent on it. So it's coming, it's a work in progress still, but we're seeing that return on it by the busy, you know, parking lot being full, people out snowshoeing, cross country skiing, fat biking and loving it. So it's, and then the other piece of that is you can drive through Elma on a Saturday in February or March, the little fishing community that's adjacent to the park be the service area um and it looks like a little mountain bike adventure town in the winter now which is awesome so there's literally a lineup of cars outside the holy whale last saturday and sunday um obviously within the, the parameters of how we're allowed to operate but when you say a lineup of cars both sides of the street had cars down them and people getting their takeaway or grabbing a stool at the bar so it was really cool to see that happening just another shot of that's my daughter hannah um so we're using the wood stoves in that pavilion building, um, you know, cooking lunch, grilled cheese and tomato soup over the campfire, so to speak. And so it's just an awesome winter space or summer space it has two huge garage doors. So in the summertime, uh, it's wide open, open air space. And um, so speaking of more other places, so Fundy's one of them, Hopewell Rocks is another we're, we're exploring. We've done a few kind of mini exploration slash pilots of what we could possibly do there. In a typical year, there's 250,000 people visiting Hopa Rocks, and they're open, I believe, from 8 till 8, uh, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. So it didn't really make sense. It was too crowded there to be able to do a bike tour, or at least they think so. I am not necessarily agree with that, but they thought it was too busy too. But in the future, and now they're looking to expand activities outside of their operating hours. So looking at offering fat bike tours, VIP experience outside of their normal operating hours. Um, you can actually ride along the beach through those tunnels um, around the flower pot rocks at low tide. Um, and we're even thinking it would be really cool to do a night tour with headlamps. So no matter when the low tide is, it's a really cool experience and very beginner friendly. Uh, fat bikes, I call them like monster trucks. They roll over anything, any terrain. Uh, they're great, just a slow moving, fun experience for people to, to see the rocks, the, the Hopewell rocks in a different way. I've um, just got a couple other shots of that. So you can see how, so again, Will, a uh, nine-year-old, 10-year-old on a 26-inch youth fat bike can ride the beach um, at low tide. Uh, it's nice and firm. Uh, you can ride over the rocks, again, like you're riding on a different planet. And it's just that we call the smile factor. Smile factor is always super high. So a lot of fun. And again, working with, so this is two of their interpreters uh, that went on a tour with us and kind of gave us the, the spiel that they would normally give their guests and visitors at the Hopewell Rocks. So we would hope to partner with the Rocks, Hopewell Rocks to offer these programs and their interpreters would come along and one of our guides to, to facilitate that or possibly even another uh, adventure outfitting guiding operation could partner with it. We might provide the bikes only, could be one way. I see Sam grinning. <laughs> so there's all kinds of opportunity to partner with various groups um, to make these things happen. And again, we'd probably include a, a food experience or a beer experience or tasting, whether on-site or off-site, depending on the location and the venue that we're trying to do these activities. Um, places, and just going back to that sort of beer and that partnership, so that's my storefront uh, to the right. Again, a little bit grainy photo and then our tenant, uh, Sussex Ale Works, literally connected to my store. Uh, they got permission to put a patio out front last year. We're hoping to expand that patio because it really adds to the vibe of our main street and the liveliness. We've had live bands out there in front of our front door after we close. So you can actually go into the brewery or into our store and there isn't a, a door that joins the two inside. So people can come and go between the two. Um, it gets a little rowdy on Friday afternoon, happy hour. So we might have to close that door at times but it's, it's an awesome synergy. If you look through that window on the right of the brewery, you can see uh, they've got some my logo, their logo. There's actually bike wheels, bike rims that they got from us. They painted and made into lamps or light fixtures or sconces, I guess. Um, and it's just, it's this really cool Opry Adventure vibe. So it's again, one of those places and those people that we wanted to partner with and it just works so well. Again, there's the patio um, of the, 
craft brewery. This was uh, pandemic times last summer, so they had it roped off, expanded it because we couldn't technically sit uh, as many people inside. You can't jam 40 people in there, so they had a couple of seats inside. And then the patio opened up uh, luckily this summer. And obviously, you can see uh, curbside pickups, they're doing a lot of takeaway of their crowler big cans. Felt like I talked a lot right there. <laughs> Any uh, comments, questions, anything? We got one here uh, from from Brandon. He was just asking about, uh, um, you know, that you've done a lot of, uh, of of things, school, work, in the industry, owning your own business. Uh, the question is, what do you think the best course of action would be to learn about running the business side of things? School, work, experience, a mix, or both? Um, I would say a mix of both. I mean, I, I certainly like <clears throat> the education piece for me was important in laying that foundation again of whether it's connecting and networking with people having a broad range of experience. So I mean, my education, the university, you know, I didn't finish that degree, but it was still great experience and, and meeting people and networking. The college program for two years was really a business focused program, which gave me a lot of valuable experience, but also connections in the industry that I still talk to to, to this day. Um, if I'm going out west for a trip and I want to connect with people, I know who to call on. And if I have questions on various business related things, I can always call on my you know, schooling instructors and, and uh, classmates from 20 years ago. And, but I think there's really nothing, nothing better than true experience, honestly, I guess would be my way of looking at it um, and learning from others that are already doing it. And that's sort of that collaboration and partnership piece. You know, don't be afraid to, to ask, don't be afraid to get involved and ask those stupid questions. Um, I, was I was lucky to be involved with the uh, Wallace McCain Institute program called Entrepreneur Leaders Program. And uh, I learned a lot there from our cohort of 14 other business owners from I'll say like multi-million dollar corporation type people to small business operators like myself but we're all realistically facing the same challenges, just different scales. I learned so much from that year in that cohort. So we got together three days a month uh, for a full year and then quarterly after that, um, but learned to be able to talk about the challenges in sort of forums like this as well. Uh, I think we tend to, I'm even getting a little off the question, but I think it's important that people are comfortable to talk about the challenges and, and how we overcome them and how we succeed from them and learn from them. So. That's one of my biggest things now is just connecting with other business owners and operators and I'll like I have no problem sharing with people that you know in that year of 2018 when we expanded into at Fundy I pretty much went broke in June before we even opened and there's not a there's not a single chance I would have shared that bit of information five years ago with anybody I would have hit, held my cards so close but to be able to say that to someone now it's like yeah you know what that's part of growing I could have gone broke. I was like, screw that. I'm getting through this and we're going to make it happen. And that's what we did. So I think that experience piece, the education piece is important. Um, what was the other part? Experience, education, and? I don't know. I think you, I think you covered it. <laughs> um, you know, somebody else was in here talking about, and I think that, you know, the, the piece with the McCain Institute that you were talking about, about finding that mentorship. Uh, yeah. Lori was mentioning it as well. I think it's really, really key. Yeah. Um, I, I am aware because I think this next piece is going to be a very interesting for folks. Yeah. I think, you know, the key piece here is, you know, um, from your perspective and sharing with others is, is that path to profitability and where you see the opportunity, um, I guess, you know, basically we're facing, you know, this season, but, you know, as we look out and beyond, you know, with the mountain biking, the fat biking, I guess, you know, I, I love how you positioned it about aligning yourself with those entities that are investing in this infrastructure and doing yeah. this development. And, you know, you've been, you've been very lucky to have that partner in Fundy National Park. Yeah. Uh, for those of us that are not as lucky, let's say, um, you, you know, maybe uh, just, you know, as you're, as you're talking and thinking uh, some insights that you might want to share with those of how you, how you engage those partners and how you get this conversation going, I guess, to, to, to start yeah. moving forward. So I'm going to correct you on one thing. Okay. I, I actually wrote this word in my presentation last night and I was like, no, 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 that had nothing to do with it. Luck has nothing to do with it. 
<laughs> I am very fortunate to have that. I, I will say that, but luck never has anything to do with it. It's all a lot of Persist hard work, <laughs> persistence, and uh, points. <laughs> so, I I was. I'll, I'll use the word lucky. I am lucky. You're fortunate to have that partnership and have and have them have the faith in me as an operator. And it's not even faith. It was, I mean, a scoring process to get to win that bid, obviously. And there was others that didn't get it. And we, we made our proposal in such a way that we felt we could achieve it um, over 10 years. And we saw the potential in there. And I think they truly believed in outdoor elements and us as a team to hit it out of the park, no pun intended, over that time frame. Um, they've been very patient as we grow through some certain hiccups uh, with them and because they're also growing as a management team and as a park and seeing you know different different visitation and different groups so it's it's kind of been a a I guess a true partnership and that there's been sort of give and take on both ends um, I'm not sure if I'm I might get off track a little bit on that, but it, it has been, like I said in this, this slide right here, that persistence. I've had to be super persistent and push hard on certain topics with working with a partner like that, because working with a federal government agency versus a private operator like myself, I can pivot on a dime and go whatever direction I want to go tomorrow. I could start selling motorcycles tomorrow instead of mountain bikes or, you know, <laughs> whatever it happens to be. Whereas with a park, it's a pretty slow moving machine. If I want to change something it doesn't happen tomorrow and, you know it's to me it's like a two-year it's a two-year process to get certain things to change whether it's something on their website or social media and they're improving those processes because they realize how important they are but it, it's not a it doesn't move quickly so that i should have wrote patience in here as well um you must have seen you know i guess for for folks as well you know you talked about the, you know, the retail side of things that, that has con come through this pan pandemic um what do you see as the i guess the future visitor experience opportunity around this sort of you know outdoor you know let's let's use the mountain biking uh fat biking side of things you know and how do you break that down to the sort of the hardcore side of things versus the you know family of four that rolls yeah. into the park that uh, you know wants something to do that's fun i guess yes um we, we definitely have a focus on the family focused group coming in. Excuse me. Um, luckily, Fundy has developed their trail system to accommodate that. So for us, like I said, the pump track, the trails are fairly beginner friendly. I can take my 70 year old dad down even the, you know, signature trail whitetail on a fat bike or mountain bike. And as long as he can operate a bike, he can probably safely get down that trail. So we really focus on you know, not the hardcore. Um, they're going to come and do their thing. Um, we are investing in our bikes being a little more hardcore, so proper full suspension bikes this year rather than just hardtails, which will make the experience better for anybody. Um, but any of our, well, I don't want to say any, but most of our marketing material or photos, videos we share are going to be, you know, kids and moms and dads and couples and that little bit softer adventure, um, not bombing down whitetail, high speed, you know, crashing and banging, hitting jumps, it's going to be pretty soft. And that's our focus. And that's Wendy's focus. And I think that's, you know, even if I refer to someone like what Sam's doing, I think she's doing an amazing job with BRAD of growing the base. And that's what we're trying to do as well, is grow that base of people in the community and grow the actual sports and activities from the bottom up and let those people grow into being the core, you know, and the enthusiasts of mountain biking or hiking or canoe and kayak and whatever it happens to be for my, in my case but I um, if I were to look at my whole operation we do that right from retail through to our adventure operator or outfitting activities and even our you know our we can talk about a youth cycling program we have a youth uh, ski exchange program so it's really building that base and the soft adventure part of it and then the next step hopefully will be you know maybe they want to go to the next level three key words that I'd use almost as a slogan in the last three or four or five years have been discover, explore, experience. So it was kind of that discover the activity, explore it a little bit further and get a little bit more into it and then truly experience it. And I think we're, it kind of goes with the, um, the life chronological of my, the 
chronological chronological life of my business kind of followed that model as well, which was we've kind of tried a few different things, explored them. Now we're truly experiencing them. So our visitors and our customers, same thing. We want them now to, we've kind of built up our base of rental operations. We have the, that infrastructure in place. And now we're hoping to really take it to the next level with the true experience um, and start partnering and adding the interpretation and the food and the beverage and and really making it happen. Not sure if I, again, get off track there or not, but. <laughs> That's great, thanks. And I'm just flying through these last few slides just to kind of give an example of, you know, um, that's just a couple, um, my friends Alan and Sarah, actually, they, they come from Moncton to Fundy to ride their fat bikes quite often. Uh, Alan, they were actually both out this past weekend. This picture's from a few winters ago, but they were out on the weekend um, helping snowshoe pack one of the trails. So Whitetail is a signature mountain bike trail, but they don't groom it in the winter. So we take it upon ourselves to go snowshoe and pack it to make it fat bikeable because it's an awesome ride. So they came out and snowshoe. I think Alan was out for like four hours snowshoeing and packing down the trail. Um, and then we were out riding it the next day. And this is just a quick, you know, shot from our Instagram. Um, we have a reservation system online for fat bike rentals, but oftentimes we have, you know, bikes available. So just drop in customers are coming all the time. So just trying to get it out there that bikes are available um, pretty much any time, except for this week, <laughs> which has been a little crazy, luckily. Um, again, partnering with people. This is the crew from A for Adventure, Chris and Jan. And I think one of the photographers, maybe they came and they were coming to Fundy for a photo shoot. We loaned them some bikes. Um, I see them tagging us in various activities and things they do and vice versa. If you're not familiar with A for Adventure, look them up. They're doing some awesome, awesome stuff with outdoor adventure and kids and community. And, and it's, it's incredible to watch what they've done over the last few years too. Uh, we actually had A for Adventure. One of my favorite events in the store was when they were doing their book launch. Um, they did a kid's book, A for Adventure, and uh, we hosted them for a book launch and book reading. And they came in and we had like, I don't know, probably 30 kids sitting around like the, the campfire basically in the store and they're reading from the books. It was a pretty cool little event in, in the community. This is um, just a photo of, so that community and collaboration piece. Um, we've partnered with the Friends of Fundy this winter and a local accommodation, Falcon Ridge, uh, the Holy Whale for beer and a brewery tour and two local restaurants. So we offer a, a Winterscape Alma uh, adventure weekend. There's two nights accommodation, um, a self-guided or guided snowshoe or fat bike, uh, brewery tour, tasting, and um, an outing at one of the restaurants. So this is just actually the first weekend we did it back in January. This is a couple that came from Fredericton back when we were able to travel between zones and they luckily got a little bit of a blizzard along their ride which uh, made for kind of a fun ride actually. So it was, uh, that was our first weekend of having a, a real package happening in Alma this winter, which was a lot of fun. We've had bookings, we've had a lot of cancellations due to COVID this winter, but we have had bookings most weekends. And I think we have some coming up this weekend as well, which is nice to see. Again, back to that uh, uh, Waterside Beach. Um, we had a crew out last, I think this was actually New Year's Day last winter. Um, so you're riding along the cliffs and there's just, you know, huge icicles hang down and the beach is beautiful. We rode all the way to one end, had a little snack and rode back. Again, same beach shots, just kind of showing that uh, the, the opportunity that exists out there along the Fundy coast. So we're, we really want to launch a uh, Beaches of the Bay of Fundy um, explore tour. There's three or four different beaches we're hoping to kind of get to with the fat bikes. Um, I'll just blast through. This was really just kind of a last slide, I think. Let me make sure I'm on the, uh, pretty much at the end. So uh, the pandemic led us to really take a close look at our processes, procedures, and planning, um, both at retail side and making sure that how we operate down the road um, is easily pivotable. Um, easily adaptable to new circumstances, um, looking hard at, you know, I guess kind of every aspect of your business and operation. So we obviously as many of you, if you're within adventure operating uh, businesses, you, you know what this summer was like. And if you're operating the winter, you know what this winter has been like. It's not been easy. It's had a lot of challenges. So having those processes that make it way easier to say yes or no to things were really important to me. 
as an owner operator, you know, if, if I have a question from staff or a customer, I needed to know that I had a clear answer for a lot of things. Um, I needed to know that I could be as efficient as possible. So we were as profitable as possible um, with smaller groups and less rentals and less people coming into the park as an example. So, you know, I think Fundy as an example went from 250 plus thousand visitors. I, I think they cut that in half or maybe 40% less, something like that. So it wasn't, it wasn't the same picture. So, you know, you had to really adjust. Some of the ways we adjusted where we had less staff, shorter operating hours. We went five days a week instead of seven. Um, we, most of our rental equipment only went out once a day. Uh, I guess the bikes only went out once a day. So we weren't repeating, we weren't, um, customers weren't sharing equipment. Our boats, we did sanitize between every use and had a time, like a buffer between equipment going out. So there was extra expenses, extra time, um, and less revenue to do it all with. So it was, uh, it was certainly challenging. And then the other, I guess for me, the other big piece of having those processes and procedures that came from the pandemic, taking a hard look at everything, was forming that consistency of what we're offering. So that, and this is a, an exercise we're still going through it now with our both HR strategy and um, our marketing uh, and branding going forward. So we're just starting that right now. And the consistency of what we're offering so that every customer's sort of getting the same thing and, and knows what to expect. And that when you walk into my store in Sussex or the store in Alma or one of our operating locations in Fundy or beyond, or coming on a tour or, or an experience somewhere that you, you know what you're gonna expect from every detail of that experience. And that's a big work in progress and I'm nowhere near where I'd like to be and what we're offering, but we are striving to be top notch um, in our consistency of our offering. John, can I just ask a question? Please. Um, you know, looking from last year to this year, and of course, you know, it's not like it's going to be consistent from last year to this year. Yeah. Um, do you still plan to offer everything that you already offer? Or are you going to be paring back any of those, um, you know, offerings to suit a more local market? You know, you talked about the, the funny national park. I mean, Again, this year, I expect if it's anything like we're kind of expecting here, like the visitors, the outside visitors are going to change that. So yeah. are you adjusting? I'm sure you are just listening to you speak for the last hour. Um, <laughs> it was supposed uh, to be 20 minutes. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, that's, it's okay. It's actually, um, it, you're very, it's very impressive to listen to you, uh, the handle that you have on the business to the development, the growth, uh, you know, your retention of your workers and all that. But, you know, when you look at, yeah, what you're going to put into the market this year. Is it going to change based on what last year and what you've learned from last year? Uh, I would say yes, to a degree. Um, last year, we put a few things on hold because you just didn't know from week to week what was happening. Um, our fingers are crossed. So we have kind of plan A, plan B for this summer, I would say, would be A is New Brunswick only for us. Um, no out of province visitors. Uh, fingers are crossed and very hopeful that we'll at least get Atlantic bubble, which was you know, still doable. Um, and I think it was, it was awesome to see last summer that we had so many people and it blew my mind that had never been to Fundy before. And they were like from an hour away. And I'm like, what in the world? How have you never been here? Yet you've been to Florida six times. <laughs> like, so it was really cool to see that. And I think there's a lot more of those people still to come out and explore. So come, some of the things we're, we will be doing that we put on hold last year, I'm just, we're just gonna push through and make it happen this year as long as we're within operating recommendations and protocols. Um, one of our trips we put on hold last year that we we're supposed to be piloting was a um, the Fundy Circuit Experience Backpacking 101. So a backpacking trip around the Fundy Circuit so it's a 50 kilometer hiking uh, experience, but it's geared toward that first time backpacker, multi-day backpacker. Um, and we provide all the gear, uh, how to, um, and a little bit of a glamping experience, but still kind of roughing it in a national park, so to speak. So it's a safe, a safe environment. But yes, yeah, so the plan is to, to do that as kind of those bubble family, small groups, push through, make it happen, make it affordable and get people out doing that anyway, because they need it as much as we do. And we're just going to kind of say, screw it. And we're going to do it. <laughs> so yeah, it's um, interesting. Yeah, it's the same kind of stuff we're talking about here is that, you know, yeah. we know that we likely won't have Atlantic Canadians here this summer. Yeah. 
So you're looking at the local market, you're looking at their price point, you're looking at, I love this idea when you talk about like the beginner's backpack, the beginner's yeah. kind of fat biking, because, and I see the same thing, especially even when it comes to Gross Morn, like more people went to Gross Morn this year from the Avalon that had never been to Gross Morn before, yeah. yet have been to Florida six times or whatever, right? <laughs> and I'm with you, like, how has it happened? But um it's true. So I think that with people locally, you know, exploring their backyard, I love this idea you talk about, about um, the beginner this, because they're truly, yes. I think the locals are truly seeing some of their own province for the first time. And yeah. so, and they're going to be our biggest ambassadors moving forward. So yeah. anyway, well done. Yeah. And I think, I guess on that, there's, I think there's so many places people haven't explored and things they haven't done. And one of our other slogans we've used over the years from time to time is from your backyard to the back country. So really taking people from that, you know, even providing them a, a do-it-yourself, you know, backyard experience to then maybe following that up with, okay, now let's take it to a, you know, a four kilometer hike into a semi-wilderness campsite to let them kind of take those baby steps. Again, that discover, explore experience. Um, so it's, it, it, we hope to continue just to keep pushing what we can on people, not pushing on them, but offering what we can so that people are getting out and realizing there's more to explore than leaving our provinces. Anything else popping up there, Jonathan? What have you had as far as, uh, have you, you have, have you had to rethink any of your pricing uh, side of things through the pandemic? Yes. Uh, I'll speak to, well, a little bit. So actually, in this sort of taking a closer look at our operation, how we can be more efficient in that slide that's sitting there. Um, this was our biggest year ever for, if, for growth um, and profitability. Our revenue was down probably 40% for our venture tourism stuff and rentals in Fundy, but the retail side grew immensely and the consumer was willing to pay, I shouldn't, this is, sounds kind of bad, but my operation had gotten in small business, I think in general has gotten to the point that they're willing to dicker on prices on everything. And I absolutely hate that. I'm not a used car salesman and I hate the car salesman industry. No offense to anyone that sells cars, but <laughs> I would much rather pay the sticker price for anything than have to dicker with somebody. And this year saw us being able to hold our line on pricing on everything. If not, like, so I'll use a bike as an example, the bike business was booming. People weren't coming in saying, oh, how much can you do this one for? Can you give me 10% off? Can you knock a hundred bucks off if I buy two? They were just coming in and saying, I'll take this one, this one, and this one because I can't get them anywhere else. And everyone was sold out. So we saw the shortage pushing demand and it was, it was awesome. And now we're learning from that and saying, you know what? We are offering quality and experience and value. We don't need to be discounting. And I've pushed that through my retail operation right through this winter. And we're now seeing higher margins by like 12 points throughout the year which is incredible for retail for me anyway so we're, we're, we're way more profitable because we've held our line and and the message has been on value and what we're providing on the tourism side of it um kind of same thing people were wanting to get out uh we didn't change any of our prices this year we held them the same as last year we had no real need to increase or decrease anyway um but i, I think the only thing we did different uh, was we did offer a shorter a shorter block of time for some of our rentals so that people could get into a lower price bracket. So if they were from, we were, we were noticing that people that live closer were taking, a, they wanna go try fat biking rather than someone was on vacation for a week wanted to go really go for a full day or a weekend. So what we noticed was people, our bike rentals were way down because most people that are traveling an hour or two to Fundy um, or bringing their own bikes for people that were traveling from Ontario, Quebec, Europe, wherever in the past were not bringing their bikes with them, so they were renting. So we did adjust pricing to make it more uh, affordable for people that just didn't want to bring a bike, even if they were close by. It's an interesting point, actually. We had, uh, I think it was on last week's, uh, we were having a conversation about um, the length of the experiences yeah. and that lots of the operators were finding that because of the, the local market, they didn't want that half day per se. Um, yeah. They were more interested in the 90 minutes to two hours kind of, kind of piece. So, yeah. so you've been finding a similar thing. Yeah, exactly. And even, even this winter with our fat bike rentals, um, 
I mean, the days are a bit shorter. We only operate nine to four in the winter where it's typically getting starting to get dark. We don't want people on the trails then it's getting colder. Um, it's been tricky. So our typical block of time is a half day or four hours for $40 for a rental. Um, but I had made the mistake of not setting our start times to make it the best for the operation. It was just convenient for the customer to pick whatever time. But if someone picks a bike at, you know, 1030 in the morning and they take a four hour block, really that bike's gone for the whole day, but only rented once. So I'm learning from that, that, you know, we do need to start setting times, both convenient for the customer and convenient for the operation to be most profitable possible. So you can turn that bike over a couple times, kind of like turning tables over in a restaurant. Um, so that's some of those things we're learning on, on how we're going to start maximizing the use of our equipment. Great points. Thank you. So we've got uh, about five, six minutes left here. Um, I don't know if you have anything that you want to sort of uh, share finally there, John, but to see if uh, anybody has any burning questions that they want to fire out. But do you have a couple of things that you want to sort of finish with, John? I'll finish with this, just these last two slides. Um, this one is just, uh, I mentioned it briefly, but one other partnership and a place that we are excited for happening right now is our local ski hill be now being a um, mountain bike park. So this is us uh, shuttling the trails before they opened um, just to go test the new trails they built this summer. We're quite excited to see that happening. It's another avenue for growth that we see in the community and the region to drive people to this area to, to enjoy mountain biking. We may be looking at, you know, partnering with them on maybe rental bikes. We'll have bikes available in the store for rent for sure, but there's definitely, uh, you know, they bring their bikes to us for repairs. There's, it's again, that other local business. It's also a large employer and a big driver of our tourism industry all winter for the ski hill, but now it's for the summer. So we're, we're seeing this momentum in the region that's incredible. And I think that was all I had. And that's just, again, taking people on rides and getting them out to explore local trails and introducing them to new things so that they get hooked on all the things we all love. I think that was it. It's awesome. A great point on the, the ski hills. It's been interesting to see the evolution that's happened around um, many of those ski hills and building out the mountain bike trails and using their their chairlifts. It was, um, you know, the, the the ski hill in Campbellton and what they've done up there. It's been yeah. amazing. Uh, Nancy, you must see that yourself, don't you? With with what's you know transpired at Sugarloaf. Oh, it's absolutely fantastic. What uh, has happened and it, it does bring in a lot of people that come to the area to be able to um, experience it. Uh, not only the visitors, but the local as well. Just like John had mentioned that a lot of people um, this past year from maybe not very far noticed that, oh my, this is what we have in our own backyard. So they were uh, able to enjoy it. Yeah. Other questions, folks? Yeah, I'll jump in there. It's uh, Robbie from Gross Morning Adventures. Uh, yeah. Thanks, John. Excellent presentation, man. I learned a lot from you. And uh, just yeah, encouraging to see like how well you're integrated with the community and the park as well. Um, so yeah, we run you know a, a, a slew of experiences uh, in Gross Morn, you know anywhere from an hour and a half to you know seven or eight days. Uh, so we've just bought some fat bikes and we're currently in the exploring phase, I guess. Uh, so we're just trying to see where it fits in. I uh, got some stuff planned for the summer. Uh, we've got a 12 person Zodiac as well. So we're going to use the Zodiac to shuttle the bikes around to a couple of water access points, uh, with trails and community. That's rad. Yeah. Yeah. So we're really excited about it, but um, I guess just a couple of things, just uh, really trying to get a sense of where, uh, like from an experiences perspective, uh, like fat biking fits into uh, like the amount of time a tour would run for. Like, is it yeah. like, what's work for you? Is it like a half day? Like, do, do you work it into any multi day kind of packages or experiences? Uh, we have so from where we rent our fat bikes in the in the winter or summer, I guess there's uh, three rustic cabins that are about uh, like a two kilometer ride away. So we do get overnight rentals for snowshoes and fat bikes. People that are accessing those cabins. So they can't drive into those cabins or remote. Um, so that'd be the only kind of multi-day we're doing. And then I would say the typical and what we're kind of looking at more or less is a less than two hour ride. Um, this is just for sort of compiling with various groups of family and friends and kind of getting feedback from them. Most people that aren't used to sitting on a bike seat, an hour is going to do it. And then they're like, oh my God, my ass hurts. Um, so <laughs> they, they aren't looking to stay on much longer. Um, so you kind of build in that little bit of an interpretation piece, a short ride, a couple of breaks along the way, 
yeah. and some other sort of the experience or food piece to typically finish or midway point is what we've what we're kind of leaning towards i guess yeah okay cool yeah sounds good um, um real quick sec just to build on that the, what we're finding in the winter right now um for a fat bike rentals a four hour block of time has been the most popular most people are bringing back the bike about three hours in and they've probably gone for a ride stopped for lunch at that pavilion building um get warmed up on for another short ride and then they're done okay so we're kind of taking track of that and seeing we we'll probably adjust our blocks of time for next winter actually okay all right cool and uh just second question there just regarding uh grooming so what do you uh use in, within the park for grooming fat bike trails <sighs> it's uh it's an ongoing challenge uh, I'll, I'll say they're so fundy went from having a volunteer uh, cross-country ski group doing all the grooming with snowmobile and some sort of a drag um, and being a, a cross-country ski trail only almost to now with the fat bike trails and snowshoes, now it's all multi-use or shared trails, not all of it, most of it. Um, they use large, so the park is in charge and so the, the federal park is in charge of grooming. They use snowmobiles and various drags and the cross-country ski implement to set tracks, but then they also use a snowmobile just to do some of the single track trails. And, but we're trying to push for next year to invest either privately, myself and maybe a local club, to see if we can come up with some sort of a contract that we can groom a little bit more user focused grooming for fat biking specifically. So with a snow dog or a snowmobile with a proper roller behind it to get more single track and more of the fun mountain bike trails. And that's also in an effort to minimize the conflict with cross country skiers because yeah. we're just ruining the trails and they're getting upset and they're complaining to the park and then it's just so. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. So the local mountain bike association here that, uh, that I volunteer with, I guess, to groom, we use, we do use snow dogs, but okay. uh, this I'm speaking specifically about Corner Brook, which is where I live uh, in the winter time. So yeah. just trying to think of ways to integrate that into the park, but uh, yeah. cool. Anyway, thanks. Do you, uh, just a quick question. Do you work with Steve or are you is that a separate company? Uh, Steve Wheeler. Yeah. A separate company for sure. Okay. Yeah. I yeah, I was chatting to Steve before I jumped on the call. Actually, he okay. said he knew you and that you were in yeah. uh, Morn uh, last winter. Okay. So we've got a, a question here in regards to rentals. How do you recommend navigating the insurance? Do you require a pre-authorization or a deposit for your equipment? Uh, we take full payment up front for all of our rentals uh, on reservation. Um, and we do have a cancellation policy. And then insurance-wise, we have insurance that covers all of our operations for all of our activities retail rental uh etc with uh i think by two or five million dollar limit i forget which it is but i'll well what's your uh, what's the general lifespan on on the bikes like how many seasons can you get yeah. from them? so that's it's, most of our rental equipment we try to kind of circulate through three years um, unless it's still in really good shape, but we tend to try to maintain it and keep it for three years. Year one's kind of that hope for break even, you're paying for it. Year two, year three, you're hopefully making money on it um, still maintaining it regularly. Um, for us, the bikes are the worst. You know, there's a lot of moving parts. And if we're using them on the beach, it's salt water and sand, and it's pretty hard on drivetrains. But we've been lucky. We've had uh, two years on well, three on some of the bikes, and they're still, still working well. Um, but yeah, I, I typically say that three years is where you're going to get the best bang for your buck and unloading them as well. So we're close to uh, end of our time. Uh, anybody have any one final question they want to ask? Awesome. Oh, Mark, do you have something you want to ask? He's good. <laughs> He's just pointing at things. <laughs> Look, uh, John. Just type in thanks. Just type in thank you. No worries. Uh, thank you uh, very much, John. It's uh, you know it's always interesting to hear the story of of these operators and you know what they've gone through and the success that they've built. You know, one of the the key things I, I take away from this is that value of that partnership uh, piece that you've built, and really that the the shift that you did from you know your marketing promotional piece into more of this event focused piece where you were investing in your community 
Um, I know that, you know, like the the um, the piece around Ellen's ride, like that was incredible, and that had uh, that had national implications. To be honest with you, John, oh, yeah, I, mean, yeah. I know that was an emotional piece for you. <laughs> it's it's and it's not necessarily about promotion of your business. It's it's about you know uh, a memorial to this incredible woman. Um, you know, and what she stood for in the cycling community. But yeah. to me, the, the, how you have aligned yourself is something I think that we can all take away and, and understand, um, especially through this pandemic, as as we, we've seen in these other presentations of where do we where do we put our efforts? Where do we put our, our sort of uh, collective um, approach to to trying to make our communities better, make our businesses better? So I, I applaud you on what you've, you've done on that. It's always a pleasure to, to hear that and share that story. So thank you once again. Um, 